Um, so to, to introduce tonight's fabulous speaker, um, Sean Gibbons is a biophysicist and microbiologist who works at uh, Argonne National Laboratory in the University of Chicago, and he's leaving our city very soon uh, to begin a new position at MIT. Um, so clearly Sean's field requires a ton of precision and attention to detail. Um, I'd like to introduce him and his connection to you as artists by quoting another famous microbiologist, if I may, uh, Jonas Salk, who is credited with uh, creating a polio vaccine. An artist's only concern is to shoot for some kind of perfection, and on his own terms, not anyone else's. So here to speak to you about the perfection of the human ecosystem on its own terms. <laughs> that was a nice transition. <laughs> Something like this, and then realizing that 
you know, swap the space shuttle up there's been space, there are these organisms that have survived for weeks and weeks in the vacuum of space. There's a guy named Dinococcus radiator, and that survived 10,000 times the amount of radiation that a human being could before dying, uh, and then reassemble his genome and just go on living like nothing happened. These microbes, they, they live everywhere, they permeate the fabric of our world. They're, they're from the deep earth, from the bottom of the ocean, to the top of the atmosphere. They're absolutely everywhere. Uh, they're everywhere they, everywhere they call home. Uh, they've figured out how to live in these places. And they have incredible metabolic diversity, and, and I, I find them a fascinating thing to study in general. So I hope I can uh, give to you some of my excitement about these guys. So as I said, everything is an ecosystem. If you zoomed in really close, this is an electron microscope picture, uh, you would see that it's a, it's a tapestry of microorganisms. These have been kind of arbitrarily colored by an artist to try to show you different types of organisms. You can kind of pick out morphology. Some of them are rods, some of them are balls. But in reality, we don't really know which, you know, if this organism is really the same as this organism, or this is really the same as this. Just looking at them morphologically, we can tell almost nothing about who they are, what they're doing. We know there are probably thousands of species uh, on some surface like this, but we have no way of, of seeing them, even with these, these powerful microscopes. We have no way of distinguishing between them. Uh, but they're everywhere, and they've been this dark matter, this biological dark matter in our world for, for as long as humans have been around thinking about these things. We've been able to look at them under the microscope, we've been able to see them, but we don't really know who they are or what they're doing. Or we haven't until the past few decades. And you know, the astrophysicists don't have a monopoly on big numbers, so we went down. So 10 to the 23rd stars in the visible universe. That's a lot of stars, one of 23 zeros behind it. The human mind cannot wrap itself around such a number. One more down. Uh, but there's about 10 to the 30th microorganisms living on planet Earth called the planet Earth home. That's seven orders of magnitude more microbes on Earth than there are stars. The stars in the, in the visible universe, it's like taking the number of stars and multiplying them by 10 million. It's a huge number of microbes, a vast number, incomprehensible number. And they're all working, they're all cranking, there's these, these gears of biogeochemistry that have transformed the Earth's crust. They have transformed it in the past, they continue to transform it now, and they will transform it in the future. Earth would be a different planet if it weren't for these things living on. So uh, before I get into the human microbiome, I, I'd like to give people a bit of a starting point uh, thinking about microbes and, and where they are at in time and space. So we know they're everywhere. But temporally, so say I'm looking up the tree of life and you're somewhere on the fringe. You're, you're one of the leaves on the tree you're in some arbitrary place. You don't know a special place on this tree of life. You're out of the edge. Let's go down. And if we look at the base of the tree about 3.8 billion years ago, uh, was Luca, the thing we lovingly call Luca, which is the last universal common ancestor of all life on Earth. So each one of you in this room can trace an unbroken line of descent of immortal life back to that, that point in that trunk. We all diverge from that. Uh, all of our ancestors won passed their genes on, and they gave rise to the next grandparent that passed their genes on that they gave rise to you. Uh, so that happened 3.8 billion years ago. Can anybody tell me how old planet Earth is? The planet itself, when did it accrete and become a ball that we would recognize as a planet? 4.5? 4.5, right on the money, exactly. Let's go one more down. So about 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth became a ball. Uh, but that ball was a very inhospitable place for a long time. It was essentially molten rock with the lava ocean for the first few hundred million years. Uh, and that's not because it didn't have time to cool, it was mostly because the solar system was so full of meteorites and asteroids that they were, they were impacting the Earth so heavily that they would melt across the continuum, creating this magma ocean. Not really a situation that's conducive to the evolution of Earth life. Life can't exist in the magma ocean, it kind of needs water. And you can't really have water when the world's evolved, it's molten rock. So the water was out in the atmosphere, or in the comets coming and hitting the planet, and the Earth was a molten ball of rock, but then it cooled down uh, right around here about four billion years ago. And they're conservatively putting life's origin at 3.5 billion years ago, but most of us say around 3.8 billion years ago. So life arose almost instantaneously in geologic time, 
after uh, the Earth's crust solidified and the Earth became a place that's even halfway hospitable. And then if you, if you look at the expanse of this timeline, uh, you see multicellular life one billion years ago arose. Um, and can anybody tell me when the first fossils were found? Like what, how old were the, the first fossils? You can see it's in the field. The oldest fossils we have. 500 million years ago. Right? So about here, everything you've ever seen in, in the museum, every fossil you've ever seen that's, that's visible to the naked eye, uh, arose about 500 million years ago. So microbes are the ancient forebears of life. They are the elders of life on Earth. Uh, they gave rise to all the forms that exist today. And the forms that exist today, everything we can see with our naked eye that we, we call life on Earth, uh, happened very recently. And if we had walked the Earth in this time, we would not recognize anything as being alive, per se, maybe some scum or something. We wouldn't have seen the Earth as a, as a living, vibrant place, even though it was. Right? have the way we have the tools to see it. Our five senses didn't allow us to have access to that world. So what was the Earth like back about 3.8 million years ago, 4 billion years ago? This is the Archean era in Earth's history. Uh, does anybody know what the atmosphere, what's the big difference between today's atmosphere and, and the atmosphere back then? The air we're, we're breathing right now. So one of the major differences in the atmosphere was there was zero oxygen here. It was an anaerobic atmosphere. Absolutely no oxygen. Anything like us, any big body, bulk cell of thing, would not survive a minute in this world. It was a fairly harsh place to live. The moon was much larger in the sky because it's moving away from the Earth over time. It's actually taking uh, kinetic energy from the Earth as it moves away and slowing the rotation. So the days were shorter as well. The Earth was spinning faster. Uh, also, when the Earth was first forming, it wasn't a sphere, and it's perfect spheres, not, not like something that's not a perfect sphere will tumble chaotically in space. So the stars in the night sky were kind of moving, where they hadn't quite settled into their positions, and they were sort of moving chaotically. So if you were a mariner back at this time, you couldn't navigate the seas by the stars; they're just moving around chaotically. But that all settled down. Uh, life arose and started doing its thing. And about 2.5 or 3 billion years ago, a very special thing happened on Earth, which was the rise of oxygenic phototrophs, or cyanobacteria. These are organisms that learn how to split water, take the electrons out of that water, and release the oxygen into the atmosphere. And over a long period of time, hundreds of millions of years, they built up an oxygen atmosphere in the Earth and built an ozone layer around the outside of the Earth. So that ozone layer had a couple effects. Uh, it, it blocked UV, so a lot of UV from penetrating the Earth, and it, it just filled the, the atmosphere with oxygen. Uh, and one thing that happens uh, in, in these planets, in the early solar system, when, when UV light hits, hits an ocean, say, is the UV energy will split a water molecule into oxygen and hydrogen. Hydrogen is so small that it can't be held by the gravitational force of the Earth at room temperature. It has escape velocity, essentially, at room temperature. So we would vent our, our oceans to space over time. But the presence of ozone and also oxygen in the atmosphere, when these little molecules of hydrogen were trying to escape, they'd encounter an oxygen molecule, form water, and rain back down the river. So the fact that life learned how to split water fundamentally transformed this planet to the one you see there, the blue marble. And Earth would not have oceans like it does today if life hadn't done this. Uh, we would look much more like Mars, because this happened to Mars. Mars vented its oceans into space and became a barren rock. So they're mighty, they, they transform planets, they're terraformers, these microbes. But they're, they're invisible to us. We didn't see them for, for the longest time. Galileo, uh, the last talk, uh, our speaker spoke of Galileo 400 years ago and then the telescope. I was able to look into space. Back then they thought the celestial bodies were these perfect immaculate orbs flying around. And Galileo described them as having crevices and bumps and mountains and, and craters. Uh, and that was heresy at the time. But, you know, 400 years after that, using these tools, being able to extend our senses and observe the physical world in a more intricate way, we've mapped the, the rotations of the planets, the movement of the planets. We, we know a huge amount about the solar system, about the universe, just from this, this tool, being able to see the unseeable, the previously unseeable. Uh, and microbial ecologists, we've only had this telescope, this molecular telescope, for 10 years. 
Texas when it arose. We are in Galileo's age of discovery, partly in microbiology, the tools to be able to see microorganisms have only existed for a brief time. And this is a picture here of Carl Woese, who should have won the Nobel Prize, uh, but he unfortunately died before he could. Uh, but he's the father of my field. Um, he invented molecular uh, phylogeny or molecular sequencing to, to be able to see microbes by their DNA sequence and kind of reach into these microbial communities, pull out sequences of their DNA and be able to say who they are and what they're doing based on that information and even be able to map the, the relatedness between these organisms and put them on a tree. And this tree is actually from Darwin's note. This is sort of one of his example trees he was drawing about if evolution was a thing, things should be related and split off from each other and form these trees. So woes really allowed us the tools to be able to build these types of trees and, and understand the microbial world in a greater way. So quickly, uh, the last slide of background, uh, we need to talk about exactly what we're looking at when, we, when I say we can see these organisms, what are we actually seeing. So you've got to choose an ancient molecule that changes slowly over time. You want to really be able to peer back four billion years in the past you have to choose a gene or a molecule that changes so slowly that on that time scale you can still see the interrelationships between organisms. Can anybody tell me what that molecule is there? I'd be very surprised if you could. That is a ribosome. Anybody know what a ribosome is? Ribosome? Part of the cell structure? Yeah, they're, they're, they're larger structures in the cell. And what they, what they, what they do they, they manifest the coded information in your genome and make it physical. They take the message from your DNA and they translate it into protein. And the protein is where the rubber meets the road and left. That's what builds our bodies, that's what does all the en enzymatic reactions and, and all the things that keep us alive. So they so the, this molecule breaks, you're completely screwed. And so this molecule evolves extremely slowly, changes can barely happen in the sequence of this molecule where it just destroys the organism and it can't pass on its genes. So you can look back hundreds of millions or billions of years of evolution uh, by just looking at the sequence of this molecule. And this is made of protein and RNA, so nucleic acid and protein. And this is the nucleic acid portion of that one down. And, and you know, we take that secondary structure, nucleic acid, we read it through these DNA sequences that we have now these fancy machines, and we get a sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's that we can use to identify who's doing what or who is who. We can build a tree like this. And if a tree like this, the guy I showed you on the last slide, Carl Hoos, is responsible for, this is the new tree of life circa, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. And it depends on when you went to high school, but you may have learned of five kingdoms of life, if you remember that. Carl Rose changed the five kingdoms because he said you know, there's really three domains of life and there's this one domain that no one has ever recognized and didn't really know about called the archaea, which are just as alien from the bacteria as they are from the eukaryotes, which are us, things with the nucleus. So prokaryotes are these two guys up here, no nucleus, the eukaryotes are down here. And this is the tree that describes the interrelationships between them all. Can do one more depth. And everything you've ever seen with your naked eye falls inside of that red circle. Get to where your virus. Viruses are, are tricky, and they, they don't exactly lie anywhere on this tree because they don't have ribosomes. So you can't build a tree like this for viruses. Um, there's a lot of theories of viruses, and I think it, well, we can talk later about it. I think it might take me on a long tangent. But anyway, every everything you've ever seen with your naked eye, all all the trees and mushrooms and plants and whatever even for the last 500 million years. I've only been in this little spot. And everything else on this tree is single cell microorganisms. But almost all the diversity of life on Earth is microbial. Okay, now we can talk actually about microbiomes and humans and all that. So that's, that's sort of giving you some foundation in what, what microbes are, where they, are, where they fall in time and space. And now we'll talk about how they relate to things like us, these large, lumbering, multicellular organisms that are made up of trillions of cells. Uh, so essentially, we are all these chimeras. This is a chimera, Greek mythology. This organism that's this fusion of multiple species. Uh, and in, in my field, we call this a holobiont, uh, which, which just means a, a conglomeration of multiple organisms. We are all holobionts. We are not just human. We are composed of thousands of different species, 
and each member of that consortium is integral to the individual's survival. Sean, are you saying hollow biomes? Hollow biomes. Bi biome. You go up one more. Biome. Oh, oh right there. Thank yep. you. <laughs> hollow biome. Thanks. So this is the human hollow biome. So we carry about 10 times the number of bacterial cells. You've probably heard these statistics. In and on our bodies as there are human cells. About 10 trillion bacteria is about 1 trillion human cells. So they have numbers by the numbers. And if you were to reach into their genomes as well, and compare them to our genome, we have about 30,000 genes. But the genes that are inside this microbiome, it's about 3 million. So about 100 fold the number, the amount of genetic potential res resides in this microbiome as, as in us. So if you were to like pull out all the micro microbes from this person's body and hold them in the you know, wet globule over here in front of me, it would be about a three pound ball, be about the, the weight of your brain. And we're now recognizing this thing as a new organ in the human body that, that we previously just ignored. Uh, but it is completely integral and necessary for the functioning of our bodies. And we've ignored it at our peril, and it's, it's led to a lot, of, a lot of problems. And it's not just random. We know who lives where, to some degree, certain you know, specific types of organisms on our skin, certain ones in our urogenital tract, in our gut, in our, in our mouth. Um, so it's, it's a definitely a, you know, it's like the savanna, or it's like the ocean, or it's like the desert. It's different environments that exist in our bodies. They're very diverse and they're very unique. And they are passed down from generation to generation to some degree. So this is a cool study done by Howard Ackman in 2010, where he looked at the lineage of the ape tree. So we are great apes. We are one of the branches on the great ape tree. Uh, and if you grew up the tree of, of that group using the genomic DNA of these organisms, you get something that looks like this over here. So you've got your chimpanzees, your bonobos, your gorillas, and over there your humans. This is based on mitochondrial DNA. And this is a sample in Africa, and they have one human sample from Arizona for some inexplicable reason. <laughs> so then what they did is they, they took the poop from all these individuals, and they sequenced the bacteria, like who's there, and then what abundance do they reside there, and created a sort of uh, distance metric based on the structure of these microbial communities, and they plotted that as a tree, and they found that they got the same topology, the tree was, was a similar topology where the chimpanzees were all one cluster, the bonobos, the gorillas, and humans. So you could reconstruct the evolutionary history of the eight tree based on the gut microbiome. So there's some sort of vertical inheritance of the microbiome in this, in this, in this lineage. And that can be due to you know, vertical inheritance, you're getting it from your mother, or it could be due to filtering of the environment. So say your genes somehow you know, select certain microbes in the environment to reside in you, and that's related to your genotypes. So we're not, you know, we're not quite sure exactly how much of one of the other is, is true, but essentially you can reconstruct one from the other. And, but modern humans are a little weird, right? There's sort of a, a disconnect with our, with our way of life that we've had for tens of thousands of years. We live outside for the most part, for most of our evolution, uh, in, in smaller groups. I mean, even I guess 20,000 years or so, we've been living in, in small cities or towns with agriculture. But still, we're outside, we're interacting with animals, we're in a fairly, fairly dirty, as we would say today, environment. Uh, but then, we look at where we live today, it's, it's quite alien to that. And it's only happened in the last couple hundred years that this is, this is happening. We haven't had time biologically to adapt to this type of environment. So go one more. So there's all these things in our modern environment that perturb the microbial communities living in our bodies. For example, this penicillin, the molecular structure of penicillin, it's saved hundreds of millions of lives at this point, probably billions of lives. Extended the human lifespan by about 10 years since penicillin was invented. It, you know, it's a godsend for, for medicine, but it's had unknown consequences or consequences that we haven't adequately dealt with. Because every time we take these antibiotics, it's a scorched earth type policy. We perturb and, and uh, damage the native commensal good bacteria that live in and our bodies, not just the pathogens. Our diets have changed radically. There's a lot of saturated fat, a lot of protein, a lot of uh, processed sugar, 
Uh, and this is very different from our, from our original diets, which were more which were heavier on um, soluble fibers, plant material, less protein, and very rarely got access to really high grade sugar. We do things like antibacterial soaps and Purell to keep ourselves clean. Uh, but is this, is this a good thing? Um, I, I think modern medicine is starting to say no, it is not. And the way we raise children, the way that children are, are raised in today's world, there's a lot of C-sections happening, and that's, that's very different from vaginal birth. So much of the microbiome we found in several studies, uh, our starting culture, our sort of you know, sourdough starting culture for humans, comes from our, our mother's vagina. And we can see, we, we've done studies where the vaginal microbiome is altered close to pregnancy. It starts to recruit organisms that are normally found in the gut to the vagina right before birth. And this serves to inoculate the child with everything it needs um, to, to develop the microbiome. Uh, we know that breast milk is not sterile before we kind of thought it was, but we know breast milk uh, has these ducts that can actually recruit directly different types of bacteria that seed the infant's micro microbiome. So the way we raise children, we're, we're all concerned about how clean everything is, uh, you know, bottle feeding, all this stuff. It's, it's really made a huge difference on, on our microbiomes. So what does that done? So one thing that has come up is this hygiene hypothesis. Uh, this, is, this is a big one, you've probably heard of it. But it's this idea that we're too clean in industrialized societies, and this has had repercussions. So this is just a, this is real data. This is a map of the world looking at the in incidence of inflammatory bowel disease, and you know, what countries fall into the high care. It's all the industrialized countries, uh, So wherever we're clean or have access to modern medicine, healthcare, uh, and sort of buildings where we reside in normally, uh, we see inflammatory diseases or autoimmune diseases skyrocket. Asthma, you know, all these gut disorders, uh, allergies, peanut allergies, these things are on the rise. Um, and we believe that it has a very strong root in the perturbations that we've done on our micro microbiological ecosystem. So yeah, there it is good for you. Yeah. I, I want to try to, there's so much microbial in the world, in the public. And I, I want to try to fight against that. So, so please, dirt is good, and don't use Peripurel and don't use antimicrobial soaps. Um, I think hopefully I'll give you some more data to back that up. Okay, so my advisor is Jack Gilbert over there, and so now I'm going to actually get into some real science that's coming out of the University of Chicago right now uh, that I've been peripherally involved in here, but others that I've actually been involved in. Uh, and this is work with Jack and John, where so John is a surgeon gastroenterologist, and Jack is a microbial ecologist. And they've been working, so, so John will do these surgeries where let's say they'll remove colon cancer from a patient and they have to stitch the colon back together. Uh, so you get this seam where you stitch the colon back together. But they have this big problem with leakiness. So no matter how good the technology's gotten with glues and stitches and different ways of really sealing that wound, uh, somehow little holes get poked at the site of the, of the stitching together and they, they try to figure out what's going on here. So what, what Jack and John were able to figure out is there's this, this organism called Enterococcus fecalis that is normally completely harmless, and in fact, very good for us. It actually trains our immune system. It helps our immune system be less inflammatory. And normally, it's just this perfectly good component of our microbiome. But when you do a surgery like this, the, the first step that, that you do is you take a bunch of antibiotics, uh, so that's a very harsh perturbation on the microbiome. Then you open up the colon, which is an anaerobic environment. So you have this poison gas still in oxygen that the, this organism will die if it encounters oxygen. So these guys are under stress, antibiotic stress, oxygen stress. And then when you seal the wound up, the body is trying to heal. So it starts to suck nutrients away from the gut in, at the, at to the wound site to, to facilitate the healing process. And in, in particular, phosphate It's a fundamental uh, nutrient that they used to build their DNA, that, that they're deprived of during this process. So what they found is Michalis says, okay, apparently, you know, everyone's against me now. And so I'm going to go to the side of the wound and I'm going to upregulate all these nutrient importers and I'm going to try to suck the phosphate back away from the body. I'm going to try to break down the walls of, of the colon and try to get at that nutrient. So it, it turns on us, right? It's normally our friend, but it becomes our foe due to this 
emotional surgery and the, and the stresses that it's encountered. And so one of the things that they're working on now is instead of using even more antibiotics to try to treat something like this, which is kind of sort of counterproductive, uh, they're, they're looking at having these these foams or this, this application of phosphate to the room so kind of slow release phosphate that will, that will allow fecalis to not be deprived of phosphate so it feels like it's okay, it feels like it's at home, and it won't go against the body. So it's just it's this simple sort of zen of trying to work around the microbe rather than trying to just kill it. Uh, and there's many stories like this all over the place that we haven't uncovered yet, but Modern medicine, this, this new branch of modern medicine involving the microbiome is, is, is a huge new thing. Uh, and it's gonna save lives and it's, it's gonna do a lot of good. Speaking of which, I'm gonna now run back here and show you guys a video. So this is the biggest success story in microbial ecology and medicine so far. I mean, you may have heard of this. This is uh, fecal transplants. So there's a particular organism named Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, if you've maybe heard of it that way. Uh, it's sort of a weedy species, and it tends to infect people after a really strong dose of antibiotics. So when you knock down the native humidity and that native ecology dissipates, this organism gains a foothold, and it won't be displaced. And it ends up giving people really severe diarrhea. Uh, and in infants and in older people, it's fatal, it can be fatal. And the really bad thing about this bug is it's totally resistant to antibiotics. Not totally, but, but a lot of people can't be treated using antibiotics to get rid of this particular disease. So what this is here, I'll briefly explain. This is what my, one of the plots that we use in microbial ecology to show the sort of differences or similarities between samples. So each one of these dots is a sample taken from a human being from one of these different environments. And the proximity of, of these dots to each other is the similarity of those communities. So you're taking all this complicated information about who's there and how much of them are there and collapsing it down to a coordinate on this plot that we can, we can view. So here you've got the oral samples, your skin in the middle, vaginal, and fecal down at the bottom. It's sort of a map of samples uh, in the context of 300 healthy individuals from the human microbiome project. So now, on top of this map, for our reference. So kind of by individuals, do you mean entirely people with vagina? Yeah. No, no, no. So the, yeah, yeah, both male and female, but okay. of course, you know, vaginal samples only. Right. Okay. There's no like female samples. What's that? There's no female samples. I don't. I know there's not. The penis microbiome is about the same as the arm microbiome. Not, it's not a huge difference, right? It's, it's the skin. It's not internal. So, but these stars are presenting now are a bunch of people up top in red who have clustering and seal infections that cannot be treated with antibiotics. They're in dire straits, they're at risk of, of death. At the bottom of that gold star, that is showing the people who don't know. This is the person they've identified with a healthy gut microbiome. And they're going to take fecal material from this donor and they're going to implant it into these these people up here, and we're going to see what happens. We have a time series trajectory of what happens to their microbiomes after they receive the implant from the donor. So essentially, instantaneously, their gut recovers. It's, it is an overnight process. It's a kind of magic bullet. And they never regress. They never go back up. They're essentially permanently cured by this treatment. So it's, a, it's an ecological way of treating people. It's, it's no longer trying to use a drug or anything like that. We're, we're manipulating the ecology of the gut to save people's lives. But what, what's the delivery system? There are several, uh, some unsavory. Uh, so one is through the mouth. Actually, I don't know why they do it that way, but they'll put a hose all the way down the lower gut and then deliver it that way. The other one is rectally. It's sort of an animal. Uh, but they now are making these pills. They're just essentially frozen pills with poop inside of them that you can just pop and it recolonizes your gut. That's uh, actually the guy I'm going to go work for at MIT, MIT has developed some of the technology to be able to do that. Now, early you spoke about the microbiome as like another organ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, when we die, does, how does it, what happens? Is it all, is it die at the same like, Does it disperse and does all of it die with us or is it like, it's a really great question. Uh, so 
there's some work on this. Rob Knight's group, who actually made this video, um, they've done some like post-mortem microbiome studies where you can like forensically tell how long someone's been dead by the microbes that are growing on their bodies. But essentially all the things that are there now are still there when we die. And some of them, there's sort of a handshake system between our microbiome and our immune systems. Our immune system tells the microbiome, this thing is alive, uh, it's in your best interest to just you know, take what you're given and, and not revolt. And you're gonna have a really you're gonna have hundred years and you can live in this, this place and it's nice and warm and great. But if the person dies and their immune system dies, suddenly the microbes can sense this and they're like, okay, now I just have a big happy meal. Uh, but this this train is, is done, I need to get out. So the, you know, they'll start to actually eat you. So it's a lot of what decomposes you is your native microbiome learns that you've died and then returns you to facilitate the process. Yeah, repopulation saves lives. So I like, I like repopulation. <laughs> okay, so this is this is getting more into the organ aspect of the microbiome. Like, why do we call it a new organ? Uh, so this is a study that I was involved in in Chicago, uh, and it really highlights how intricately we are entwined with our microorganisms. Um, so this is with Eugene Chang, who's a medical doctor, Vanessa, a postdoc, Jack, my advisor, and my friend Alan, who's in biophysics as well. He does fancy math things, but for oscillations and noisy biological data sets. But this cartoon tells us everything we need to know, but it's a little noisy, so I'll try to walk through it uh, slowly here. So at the top, we have mice that are grown sterilely. So we can do this in the lab. We can grow these mice. We can have these mice live out their lives in a bubble uh, where they never encounter microbes and, and they're sterile throughout their whole lives. And we've known this for a while, that if you feed a sterile mouse a really high-fat diet or a really low-fat diet, it doesn't matter what you feed them, they're not going to gain an ounce of weight. Uh, there's no weight gain, there's no diabetes, there's no health problems associated with that. Uh, essentially, you need a microbiome to get fat. Uh, that's, that's something we know now. But, now if we go down to conventionally raised mice that, have, that are non-sterile, we feed them a nice low-fat diet, we see that there are these oscillations over the day in their microbiome. Some organisms are more abundant than noon, versus some are more abundant at midnight, and so there's this dynamic thing occurring on a daily time scale. Before, we didn't think that they grew that fast. We thought maybe things were dividing once a day. But in reality, now we're seeing that things are changing very quickly. Uh, and when we have these nice oscillations in the microbiome, we also see that our biological clock is nicely coupled. So in, in humans, we have both the central nervous system clock, which is entrained by blue light, uh, and we also have a liver clock, which sort of regulates our metabolism throughout the day. Uh, and these are normally coupled together so that your central nervous system is telling you, like, when you go to sleep, you want to be you know, storing triggers, or when you're awake, you want to be put in out of the bloodstream, or however that works. I'm not a human person. Yes. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the proper functioning of your metabolism during Wake, wakefulness and sleep is regulated by this clock. And this clock seems to be somehow impacted by these microbes because when you feed a high fat diet to a, to a mouse, you blunt the daily oscillations in the microbiome or even destroy it altogether. And we see that there's a decoupling between the central nervous system clock and the liver clock. So that the functioning of our biological clocks require input from our microbiome in order for them to, to, to work properly. And so Vanessa really looked into this in detail and found that there's this particular group of microbes, lactobacillus, um, they're anaerobic fermenters, and they produce these compounds called short-chain fatty acids. Uh, these are molecules we cannot produce ourselves. We do not have the genes in our genome to make these things. Uh, but these organisms, these lactobacillus, they are the ones that are oscillating, and when they're really abundant, they're pumping out a lot of these short-chain fatty acids, in particular butyrate. So there's a pulse of butyrate at a particular time of day in our gut. And so when Vanessa took butyrate, just, just pure butyrate, and pulsed mice that were sterile with butyrate, because the sterile mice have a, have a disrupted circadian clock as well, I forgot to mention. So their clock's not working well either. But if you pulse these mice with butyrate at the right time of day, their clock goes right back in the same. Uh, so it's, it's one small example of how, over millions of years of our evolution, we've come to outsource a lot of our functionality to the microbiome, uh, and, and it really provides for us in a lot of ways. And we're, we're continually learning every day how, how much it does. Okay, so I'm going to move into, for my last few slides, the built environment, which is very new 
environment for us to live in as humans, and we spend about 90% of our lives inside, completely alien to what we, to our prior experience of evolution era. Um, and the built environments composed of a lot of inert types of things, uh, cement or, or metal or porcelain, uh, things that don't have a lot of food or you know, new moisture for microbes to live on. So there's not a lot of activity happening, microbiologically speaking, on these surfaces. Uh, Notice most of the actions happening right here on our, on our bodies. We're walking, talking, happy meals for these things. But we're dispersing them out into the environment as we move through our world. Uh, and how does that impact the built environment? And then does that then feed back to our own health? So that's what we're going to explore. So actually, can you play that video? cover the cursor. <coughs> this is a little animation made by some collaborators in Oregon, just to, to sort of show you what if we could put on micro goggles and look out of the room, right? Uh, and, you know, as I say, some of you are making faces, but uh, you should be happy that this is how it is. These are our friends. They're all around us. <laughs> if you look like the handprint, for example, I have oils on my hand, and when I touch the wall, some of those oils left them all and they're just completely covered in the microbes that are living up on that as a substrate. <laughs> Not only that, but you know, as we breathe, we're, we're dispersing tens of thousands of microbial cells into the air. Uh, and we're all sharing each other's microbiomes as we sit in this room. Uh, we're all a little more microbiologically similar by the end of this night than we were when we walked in. Uh, so the built environment, it's important to understand how the flux of microbes affects us and affects the surfaces that we interact with. Like, can we get sick under certain conditions in certain types of built environments, or can we engineer built environments to be more conducive to human health and well-being? I think we can go to the next one. So, one of the big projects that my editor Jack is working on, along with Dan Smith and Simon Lax, a postdoc and a grad student, um, is the, the hospital microbiome. So, U Chicago just built a new hospital, this big new fancy hospital. And they allowed Jack to get in there with the swabs and like swab the whole thing before any human moved into it and look at what microbes were living there. And then after they moved in, after humans moved in, to kind of follow over time. So they had a year-long time series where they sampled every single day, multiple rooms, multiple patients, multiple nurses, uh, multiple different types of services, and just kind of tracked the microbial ecology of this building over time. Um, and they found some pretty cool things, right? Like essentially overnight when a person moves into a space, the space starts to look just like them. It looks like their microbiome. So we're very, we very rapidly populate any room we, we inhabit with the microbes that live in and on our bodies. Um, and it, that could be a problem if you're really sick or you have uh, some pathogen, because then you're dispersing that organism as well. So how do we manage those types of scenarios? Uh, the one thing about hospitals is they're very sterile. Uh, despite the fact that we get a lot of noxomial infections, hospital related infections, People get sick a lot in hospitals from these really nasty bugs that are antibiotic resistant, that are, that are, that are really noxious things. Um, and they have, they have been able to get rid of that with just sterilizing the surfaces. So Jack is a fan of the Crimean War hypothesis. Florence Nightingale during the Crimean War, this famous thing where she opened all the windows in, in this, this room where all the soldiers were recovering, and he got fresh air into the room. And, and they saw very quickly uh, uh, increase in the recovery rate of these soldiers just with some engine some fresh air. Because in this in this room when everything was closed off, these guys are just exchanging their bad microbiomes back and forth with each other. And when you open the windows you're getting a flux of things from the outdoors, nice uh, diverse populations of microbes that don't care about humans. They, 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 could, they could live with you or without you, but they're not bad for you. Uh, and you're sort of mixing out the bad and, and mixing in some of the good. So Jack's a big proponent of maybe having a spray or having a spritz of some sort of cocktail of good bacteria that are then prophylactic to bad guys, that they're actually the weeds, right? If you get rid of everything else, the weeds are left. These bad uh, resistant infection type organisms. But if you can populate your surfaces with this inert community that's, that's beneficial to humans and you can displace those weeds, that might be a better way to manage hospitals than the way we've done it uh, so far. Uh, so another kind of follow-up study on, on this hospital thing is the Home Microbiome Project, which, which caught, got a lot of attention from the media, so you, you may have heard of it. But this is, again, uh, Jack and Simon, I was involved in this one as well. And we wanted to ask the question, you know, you have a, a family or a person moving into a new space, 
does the space define the person's microbiome? Or does the person's microbiome define the space? Do they stay separate, or do they become something totally different? Right? Some sort of synergistic thing. Uh, and incredibly, what we found is it's it's, it's overnight. As soon as people move into a new home or a new space, uh, it looks just like them. Uh, and that signal decays over time. So Jack's family was actually in the study, and they found that when Jack would go on uh, you know, a business trip or go to a conference and leave for a few days, they could see his signature decay as he left the house. So they could tell when he was home and when he was gone. Uh, there was another interesting story of a, of a couple with a lodger. There were three people living in the same house, but two of them were a couple. One was living in the basement. Uh, and you could tell which one was the couple by the microbiome on the inside of their nose. For whatever reason, that, that, that their microbiomes on the inside of their nose are right on top of each other for this couple, but not the lodger. So you could tell who was intimate right, based on, on their microbiome. Uh, and another cool thing from the study too that Jack likes to play up because he has a dog and he loves dogs, is that if you have pets or you have dogs and cats that are outdoor pets, they can actually bring in things from the outside. And they sort of mm -hmm. augment the diversity of your house. So you, you get more outdoor bacteria that you wouldn't normally see in your, in your home by having these pets and then you can trace the, the transfer trajectories of what, what's transferring what to who. Uh, and this is another one I did, uh, which kind of got some weird press, so I thought I'd mention it. Um, it was looking at the ecological succession of microbes on bathroom surfaces, public restrooms. And we wanted to ask the question, if you just totally scorched the, the surface, destroyed all microbes that were there, there was a picture, you know, under the microscope you can see the little dots of light or, or living microbes. By about 20 minutes of, of bleaching, we pretty much got rid of everything. So we start from that, we start from nothing. What shows up first, what shows up next, what's well, the successional trajectory? Uh, and we found that in the beginning, it starts off really crappy. I mean, there's a lot of poop bacteria uh, <laughs> on these floors. And this is likely due to the fact that when you flush, you aerosolize some of the people that come out of it, and they get dispersed very quickly. Um, but then over time, this red bar is skin related organisms. So skin related taxa begin to dominate over time. Which is probably because of the fact that a fecal microbe, when it hits the floor, it's, it's pretty unhappy. Right? It was in a nice, warm, anaerobic place, and now it's in this dry, aerobic, light everywhere. It, it's going to die. It's probably going to die or go dormant. Whereas the skin, they're, they're fairly used to that type of an environment, so they're probably hanging out a little better. Um, and then, interestingly, if you just clean with normal soap and water, normal janitorial surfaces, we, we, we looked at this, these rooms over the course of several months and found that. The skin dominated state persists in the face of normal cleaning. So you only get this really huge peak in, in poop bacteria if you just bleach them. But the poop bacteria never get a foothold if you just use normal soap and water. So don't clean your bathrooms too thoroughly, you're just going to be inundated with crap. <laughs> uh, but, but it was kind of a complicated or maybe subtle study in some way, so there was a lot of different press coverage. Some were like, oh, it's no problem, go use the restroom, like, there's nothing dangerous in restrooms, public restrooms are great. And others were like, what things lurk in your restroom? <laughs> so it was very, it was, it was very bimodal. There was no in-between subtle articles on this. Um, and I would say, you know, it's, it's I, would, I would go more on the go ahead and use the restroom side personally. But of course, basic hygiene is always a good idea in public spaces because Things like flu viruses are very mobile and they transfer very easily. So just washing your hands with normal soap and water, not antibacterial, uh, but just normal soap and water is a good precaution in a public space where people are passing things along. Okay, so my last slide on um, science is this cool little study on forensics, microbial forensics. Um, so myself and fellow grad student Simon Lax did a, a two-day study where we sequence the bottoms of our shoes and our phones every hour, I think 48 hours, every waking hour for 48 hours. Um, and this is again one of those plots where distance between points is the similarity between samples. And so here we're colored by person one in blue to Simon, person two in red to me. So we definitely kind of group the part and kind of tell who was who overall. If you look at phones in blue and shoes and floor in, in red and orange, the shoes and the floor map on top of each other. And so oftentimes, shoe samples look exactly like the samples you were actually standing on from the floor. So there's good mapping between what's on your shoes and what you're walking on, as we would have expected. Uh, and the phone had a great mapping to your hand, your skin microphone. So we could identify individuals based on you know, 
what who was touching what, essentially. And this is just a sort of barcode now of our microbiome. So these are time points and columns, and the rows are all individual types of microbes. And so you can see Simon and I have very different microbial signatures, so we're very easy to tell apart. Uh, and over time, we're fairly stable. There's some lips, but uh, we look pretty similar. If you like pull it, pull out like where we were, where we were walking, you can see right it's person one's living room. The circles are, I believe, yeah, shoe samples, and the squares are samples from the floor. And so you can see they kind of map on top of each other. But Simon's uh, living room look fairly different from his office. And the blue circles, uh, he actually there was a pub crawl the kind of the day he was doing this, and there were three bars on his list. So they all kind of cluster on top of each other. And down here, you know, I had my living room, I went to a friend's house for dinner, and that's all these blue dots over here. You could sort of map where we went and, and what surfaces we were interacting with uh, based on this. Okay, so uh, that's just a, a smattering of, of recent stuff that's happened in this field. It's fast moving, there's too much to talk about, it's super exciting, uh, but I'm really happy that this type of an event is, is going on where artists and scientists are interacting, because I see art like this every now and then, and I imagine if I was a child walking through a museum seeing something like this and thinking, my God, we're covered in these little tiny organisms. And, and that, that's, that kind of a spark can launch a scientist's career. Uh, so science feed, definitely feeds off of art, and art inspires science as much as science might inspire art. Um, so you're never alone. You're all, you always have this ecosystem with you. Treasure it, take care of it, and, and it will take care of you. Thank you. not exact, exactly heritable changes in, the, in your genome, but differences in uh, what's called methylation, or, or I guess adding different chemicals to the backbone of DNA that changes the way the DNA is expressed. So usually DNA is kind of clumped into chromatin. If you pepper the outside of DNA with different handles or different molecules, uh, you, can, you can entice that little strand to kind of be pulled out. And once it's pulled out and it's accessible, then all these protein machinery can come in and, and trans transcribe that DNA into RNA, which then gets translated into protein later. So differences in, in the decoration of the genome with these different molecules can really change the way uh, our, our genomic information is manifested in our phenotype or in, in what we look like. Um, and so yes, this is, a, this is a big thing. Like They've shown things like uh, starvation in your grandparents. Uh, changes their epigenetics, which is passed through multiple generations and can like extend your lifespan. There's some studies in Sweden, and I think other Scandinavian countries to show this. Uh, so this that's definitely a field. I'm, I'm not a huge expert in epigenetics, but I have one classmate who's sort of at the nexus of epigenetics and immunity. And in that nexus, the microbiome plays a role. So you can, you can see there's, a, there's an interaction between how the immune system is trained from child to adult by the microbiome, which in turn influences the epigenetic signature of your genome. So it's, people are working on it. I guess at a very basic level, if, if we're hypercoping, that is, contract and reprobing, are there any insights into how my child might shift, how they might invite different, like different terms of bio microbiome that they or if there's is, is playing out or is too soon? So I don't know actually. Uh, I don't know if the study has been done with the hygiene hypothesis from the epigenetic angle. I actually don't know if that has been looked at. Um, so here's what you think about probiotics in medicine. Like, orally, I don't know if it's in the middle or in the Does this become a good microbial diversity? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So there's a lot of there's a lot of work being done on that. It's obviously a huge economic uh, potential there. Um, the short answer is it's complicated. 
uh, yes, probiotics probably work in some instances, but I can't, as a scientist, you know, tell you that they will work generally. Right? Uh, there's no smoking gun for what exactly works all the time, except for fecal transplants. That's a probiotic that works every time. Right? So we can say we can put that in the wind column. But <laughs> otherwise, there's there's some mouse studies that have promised. Right? So lactobacillus has been shown in some mice to, to increase lifespan or to improve health. Uh, I know Jack is currently working on a, an autism study where there's this, I think it's a bifidobacterium that seems to totally cure the mouse model of autism um, just by adding it, adding it back in. Um, but then again, you know, the mouse model of autism, how relevant is that to human autism? And does the my, mouse microbiome also translate to the human microbiome? So there's a lot of disconnects there that we haven't bridged. I think it's an enormous potential. I think it's gonna be a huge branch of medicine. I think in the future, when you go to the hospital, there's gonna be a microbial ecologist specialist, an MD in the future, just like you have your gastroenterologists or your oncologists. That's gonna be a whole wing of med school in the future. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. We're still, on the on the research side, we're still trying to figure it out and you know, get the basics down before we can spin it up and really actually make a difference in people. I have two totally unrelated questions. The first, from early in your talk, when the Earth was relatively young, it was being bombarded all the time. How come all that bombardment stopped? I mean, there was reason for the Russians, and for the most part, that doesn't happen. And the second unrelated question is, Let's assume you uh, have gone over to the appetizer table and you pick a sausage and it fell off your plate under the floor. Somebody else stepped on it. Would you eat it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start with the first. <laughs> so, actually, it's a very relevant and good question. Right? So, when the solar system formed, it was just a cloud of rock and dust. Uh, most of the mass of the solar system condensed and became what is the sun. But then what remains, uh, kind of ran, all these chunks ran into each other, and over time things with large enough gravity started to vacuum up their, their little neighborhood of rock. And so that's where that's how the planets form. So the early solar system was sort of a, a, a reduction of the chaos of all that debris floating everywhere, and a lot of that mass being centered in on the planets. But for a long time, there was still a lot of crap flying around. Uh, but essentially, I think most of it got vacuumed up by Jupiter. Uh, so Jupiter was like our solar system vacuum. It just kind of went around and got rid of most of the asteroids and meteorites in our solar system, which is good for us, because otherwise we'd be in trouble all the time. But in the early like Earth, it had not yet happened, and so we were just getting bombarded and left and right. And actually, there's, there's some cool thinking on there are, these, there are these microbes that are so resistant to, say, being in space, they can survive very, very long periods in space. And, and like, why, why would you evolve that trait? Why would life evolve that trait? But I know there's some thinking that life actually evolved during that bombardment period. And as you know, something came in and smashed into Earth, it would kick up a huge cloud of debris. And that debris would have rocket that had embedded in it life forms that could persist in space for a long period of time. So that debris cloud would kind of fly out to Earth, Earth would become this magma ball, but it would slowly cool down in the same amount of time that it took that debris cloud to slowly fall back in onto Earth and reseed it with life again. So that's one idea for how life may have emerged and survived that bombardment. And also uh, a theory for why we think that Venus, Mars, and Earth sort of maybe all shared the same life. So if life evolved on any, any of the three, it would have gotten mixed across by these, these events. So that's, that would be interesting on Mars, if we do find life, does it have, does it seem to have the same evolutionary origin as Earth? That would be very interesting. So we're going to evolve from it. Okay, the next question. Uh, you know, if you dared me, I would eat it. I, I wouldn't I would not eat it. I don't know if I would just, like, for fun, eat it. That's just nice to But as a scientist. As a scientist, I would eat it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, what's dangerous about meat is when it spoils for a period of time when there's something that's been able to grow, right? Some, some 
poisonous bacteria has you know, grown over some period of time and there's enough of it there. No snakes in the poison. There's enough of it there to make you sick. But if it just falls on the floor, that bad bacteria is going out in high enough abundance on that spot on the floor unless something bad's happening in the vicinity uh, to, to really bother you. Is there any scenario where you would like to why do we have it? Any cut? Like, when do you think it affects you? That's a good question. The only time I would ever walk my hands with antibacterial soap would be if I was working, say, in a hospital on a patient who had, like, antibiotic resistant staphylococcus aureus. Right? If you're a healthcare worker working with people with these strains of microbes, that if you catch them, there's a chance you'll die. It's a bad situation. You just want to totally remove that possibility altogether. Then, then sure, antibacterial soap has its use. But for the general public, I think it's done huge, much, much more harm than good. Yeah. Just one, one last question. All right, cool. Um, I'm here to know if you've done any studies with like macrophytes, and if so, what are some like maybe the negative like responses that you see in your research? So, like an antibiotic. Yep. So the, yeah, they're, they're micro micro cytal. Like <laughs> static okay. molecules, right? Some antibiotics fall into one of the other category. The static ones simply just don't allow the microbe to divide. Just makes it go into stasis. It doesn't kill it directly. It stops it. Is that dormant? Is that what that? Is? Yeah, essentially, it kind of goes goes dormant. It can't. So, for example, it can't make its cell wall. It uh, doesn't have the components to build the cell wall to divide or something like that. Uh, and, and then there are ones that like make it light. Right? So make, there's one where it can make protein that just kind of stops everything. But um, have I done any work on that? Uh, well, lots of people have done work on that. Um, although most of the development of those types of molecules ended back in the 60s. Uh, we haven't had many new ones for a long time. That is a huge research effort currently. Um, one of the big problems is we can't grow 99% of all the microbes that exist in the environment. And we know that they have all these great antibiotics, all these great molecules we can use as weapons against disease, but there's no way we can actually hope for them to get them to grow. Um, so there's a, there's a group that just had a paper in Science recently where it was filtering soil organisms using a really novel technique where instead of using some recipe for some medium, it actually used soil itself as the substrate on top of some membrane. And they're able to grow a huge, much larger fraction of the community that way. And they found a novel antibiotic doing that. Um, but I, I'm not personally involved in antibiotic research. Okay. Well, I'm distinctly aware that I'm leaving a handprint in the hall right now. If you're the one there, if you guys are all leaving a handprint in the elective study tonight, 